embarrassing moment. Sometimes the question itself is embarrassing, isn't it? Uh, We all have them. Sometimes there's too many to choose from. I remember taking a beautiful young lady out for a date one time, first date to ice cream, to tragically realize I didn't have my wallet. Very uh, embarrassing. I've spent a lot of time in Mexico trying to learn Spanish. Some of you have learned some languages. Chris, is you, you uh, had to learn Russian. Uh, when you learn a language, uh, you're often insulting your host uh, unintentionally uh, and, and saying uh, bad words, uh, things I can't repeat in church. Uh, not only this, you soon become best friends with those on your own linguistic level, so four-year-olds. And, you know, the adults are talking and you're, you know, playing with cookies and Legos. And, hey, that's not a bad gig all the time, you know. Uh, well, as we continue through our series in the Romans letter, we're going to see that some people think the author, Paul, should be ashamed. He should be embarrassed about some things. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the shame of the gospel, the privilege of the gospel, and the product of the gospel. Shame, privilege, and product. And uh, can we get a little more lights up for, the, for those who like to use their scriptures? Uh, but it will be on the screen as well. Romans 1, 1. So let's first look at the shame of the gospel. Actually, in verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why does he need to say this? Well, to an ancient person, Jew or Greek, everything about Christian, uh, Christianity's foundation is strange, shameful, even offensive. God becoming a human being, a real human being, flesh and blood, born into poverty. Not only that, born in kind of a podunk, backwoods kind of a place. And he takes the position of the slave in life and in death. He suffers a slave-like death on a Roman cross. Paul says in Philippians 2.7, Jesus gave up his divine privileges, taking the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. He appeared in human form, humbled himself, and died a criminal's death on a cross. Some of us wear crosses around our necks. We have a cross behind us here in the sanctuary. And if you really think about it, it is a strange thing. I mean, imagine if Jesus were executed today by lethal injection, and then we wore syringes around our neck, or put a syringe up here behind us. That's really what we're doing. Very strange indeed. The cross would not be a positive symbol of Christian art for at least 400 years after the fact. No, this is one thing Jews and Gentiles can agree on, and there's not much. But they can agree that the crucifixion of Jesus makes no sense. In another letter, Paul will name the elephant in the Corinthian room by saying, yeah, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. Christ crucified. The the Jews see this phrase as a contradiction, oxymoronic. Christ, king, crucified? For them, it's a stumbling block. The the Greek word there for for that doesn't take a Greek scholar. It's scandalon. It's a scandal. And, And for the Greeks, Christ crucified is foolishness. The Greek word morion, moronic, idiotic. And not only does the founder of Christianity have some PR issues, this Jesus, uh, his followers aren't society's best and brightest. Uh, They're the the deplorables, somewhat uh, losers in the Roman hierarchy. A few verses later, not many of you were wise by human standards, tells Paul to the Corinthians. Not many were influential, not many were of noble birth. Imagine reading that. Thanks, Paul. But they are. They're the slaves and the sick, social outcasts, single moms, widows and orphans, women in general, uh, abandoned infants at the dump. These people find a place in Christianity where they're loved, valued, honored, and taken care of. Ancient society does not necessarily find this virtuous. The ancient world is more like Sparta, more like revolutionary France, Nazi Germany. If You contribute to society. If you're strong, then you're valued. If you're weak, then you serve the strong. Or if you're too weak, then we take you out. If you're a drain on society or you look like one, you're discarded. 
And it's against this backdrop that Paul writes this famous letter to the Romans, introducing himself in Romans 1.1, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. Many of your translations will say servant, and in my humble opinion, I think that's a mistake. The Greek word doulos always means slave. Translators are concerned sometimes, rightly, that that word has so much baggage to our own country's uh, history of the slave trade that they'll, they'll often downplay it. Uh, but the word does mean slave. And Paul's use of the word is intentionally jarring, strong, provocative. Paul is a slave of Jesus. Jesus takes the form of a slave, dying a slave-like death. And Paul addresses the Christians in Rome. Many of them are real slaves. And we'll talk about who Paul is in a moment, review. But So again, he says, For the Jews, a stumbling block, scandal. For Gentiles, this is foolishness, moronic. Paul is very familiar with both Greek and Jewish culture. I wonder what, he might, he, what might he say about American culture. Because every culture will have things they like about Christianity, and every culture will have things they don't like about Christianity. For example, our Western culture likes the idea of God's grace and love, but doesn't resonate with the idea of God's authority and judgment. Ironically, in Eastern cultures, the opposite is often true. Uh, For them, God's authority makes perfect sense, but grace, that is somewhat scandalous. It's really interesting. Western culture doesn't like God's, uh, Christianity's perspective on sexuality. Uh, Eastern culture doesn't like Christianity's view of equality. So it's just kind of interesting to think about. No, Paul says he's a slave to Jesus, which would have been a dishonor in Rome and probably a damper in America. And yet Paul, he's not, he's not concerned about this. His former prestige, prominence, accomplishments, all the things that society says make someone valuable, uh, he says they're trash in comparison. His most important, important association is with the shamed Jesus. So to most people, this looks like shame, scandal, offense, but to Paul, this is his privilege. And so that's the shame of the gospel. Let's look at the privilege of the gospel for Paul. First, this is a privilege to him because of who his master is. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God, an apostle sent out to preach his good news. Normally, people don't brag about being a slave or a servant unless, unless you belong to Christ Jesus, unless you get to work for God's chosen king. And all of a sudden, this is subverted. See, before meeting Jesus, Paul thinks he's working for God. He finds great privilege and zeal in protecting the traditions of his ancestors. If Paul had posters on his bedroom wall, they wouldn't be of sports stars or, uh, or, or pop models or supermodels. Paul's posters on his wall would be heroes of the faith. Men like Phinehas and Elijah. Phinehas, you might remember him. He's famous for spearing an Israelite man and a Moabite woman, uh, killing them right in their act in Numbers 25. Uh, God commends his devotion. You might remember the prophet Elijah leading an attack on 950 false prophets in 1 Kings 18. They're all killed. See, for the people of Israel, idolatry is such a big deal that God sometimes raises up people to purge it from their country. So when Paul sees some of his Jewish friends suddenly worshiping a man, every alarm bell in his head is going off. He must fix this. He must solve this. He springs into into action. He must uh, take on the mantle of Phinehas and Elijah, defending his country and his faith. Last time Israel fell into idolatry, they were exiled, kicked out of the land, and he won't let it happen again. So he pursues these Jesus followers, throws them into prison, and even oversees the death of Stephen, a church leader. This is his great privilege to serve the God of Israel. But then he actually meets this God and realizes he's got it all wrong. A light flashes from heaven. A voice asks, Saul, Saul, his Hebrew name, why do you persecute me? Paul sees the God of Israel and realizes he's looking right in the face of Jesus of Nazareth. 
And in some ways, everything changes for him. See, Paul now worships the Jesus he tries to eliminate. He serves the Jesus he tries to eliminate. No longer pursuing violence. But in other ways, Paul's very much the same person. He, he's always, his whole life's been about serving God. And now he has more clarity on who he's actually serving. Paul is a slave to King Jesus, and it's the adventure of his life. It makes me think of Psalm 8410, a song on Israel's Spotify playlist. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. We used to sing a song about that. Better is one day, right? The songwriter sings, I'd rather be the butler. I'd rather be the maid, the the doorman, the servant in God's house than party it up uh, in evil people's homes. One day, just one day with God is so much better than three years somewhere else. One day in his temple. And in reflecting on this verse, I'm obviously thinking a lot about my upcoming wedding. And as many of you know, I'm getting married this summer. And uh, we're going to Hawaii for our honeymoon. And as you can imagine, I'm really excited. But I was thinking about it, and the contrast here, it's really thought-provoking if I believe what the songwriter says, that one day with God is better than my wedding day. One day with God is better than a thousand Hawaiian honeymoons. And this isn't to say that our honeymoon won't be great, but it is to say that our relationship with God is categorically better on a whole nother level. I think Paul would agree. There's more joy and peace and satisfaction serving and belonging to Jesus than anywhere else. David Livingstone, a Scottish missionary who spent lots of time in Africa, once said this, if a commission by an earthly king is considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? Well said. There's always sacrifice involved, but in this case, you would never not do it. Double negative. You would always do it. You'll always want to. If one of your favorite celebrities calls you up and asks for your advice or your help on something, I think you would be really privileged. If Pastor Tim Keller calls me up and asks for my help, my jaw would hit the floor. I'd be so amazed. You know, whatever sacrifice I need to make, I'll drop anything and I'll want to do it to help someone who's so helped me. So Paul is privileged because of who he belongs to, who he serves, who his master is, but he's also privileged by what he gets to do, by the work he gets to do. And we see this in the big idea of the entire book. In school, they might call this the thesis statement, what you're trying to prove, the big idea of your uh, essay And Paul is in Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. As mentioned earlier, it's as if he's saying, you know, some people think I should be ashamed about this message Uh, about my master, but I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. Put positively, I'm proud of the gospel. This is the privilege of my life. Well, there's at least four reasons for a sense of privilege that we see in these two verses. First is he gets to, uh, privilege one is watching salvation and transformation. I'm so impressed by the many of you who serve in the medical field or firefighters, paramedics, police officers, right? I think of Brian, Steve, Vinny, uh, a lot of you guys that have have served in in that way. And many of you have literally saved lives. And I can imagine that's an immense privilege. Uh, I'm impressed by the River Valley teachers and administrators that work with students. And and I heard a story this last week of of a, a, a River Valley teacher preventing a student suicide. Really amazing that we have uh, River Valley people in those positions. And for all the stories we hear, there's probably hundreds that we don't. I think of counselors and, and many others who help save marriages or who help save someone's finances or save them out of addiction or abuse. 
There's a lot that humans need saving from, don't we? Uh, in the Psalms, for example, all the references to salvation are very earthly and, and physical. Someone's chasing David with a sword, trying to kill him. And David says, save me, God, I need salvation. It's not until we get to Isaiah where salvation is more than just something physical. It's not just needed for enemies out there, but for the enemies in here. Jesus teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. See, if salvation in our earthly situations is important, and it is, uh, how much more salvation in our eternal situations? Salvation from sin, evil, and death. We will experience these things, but in the case of the Christian, they don't get to win. Sin, evil, death, they don't get to have the last word. Death and evil don't define our story. So salvation isn't just a conversion. It isn't just saving souls. Salvation to Paul is a real rescue. Partially now, but ultimately on that last day when Jesus appears. Notice that Paul says the gospel is the power of God. Greek word dunamis, right? dynamic, dynamite-like. I've always liked big tractors, uh, explosives, firearms, fire. I think that's a guy thing. Um, I was something of a pyro in my younger years. <laughs> Ask my mom about it. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe it's, like, again, maybe it's a guy thing. Big displays of power, and an ancient Roman boy was no different. Uh, they like fire and catapults, you know? Uh, and their culture, too, was obsessed with power, status, military might, political connections, wealthy friends. And Paul tells these Roman Christians, I'm not embarrassed of the gospel because there's a real power at work here. In fact, although Jews think this is scandalous and Greeks think this is moronic, Paul finishes that verse we talked about earlier by saying, to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. It might look weak, and foolish and scandalous, but it's actually real wisdom and power. It might look like constraint to Americans, but it's actually real freedom. Where do we see God's power the most? Sometimes it's in signs and miracles and wonders and things like that, but the display of dunamis is in, I think, primarily change lives, transformation. That's the two things I love most about my job, getting to watch changed lives and getting to study the Bible. And those two often really intersect. In 2 Timothy 3, the Apostle Paul points out the danger of just settling for the appearance of change instead of the real power that God offers us. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. These people, Paul says, look good on the outside, but deny the power of God. It's not a real and lasting transformation. And it's worth asking this, the question, if someone says, I'm a Christian, if they say, I've received Christ for salvation, but their life looks no different, there's no power, is it really real? Have they really met Jesus? Imagine if I walked into church this morning and I'm like, wow, guys, praise the Lord. I uh, just got hit by a car as I turned uh, off of Redwood Highway into Midway. It was crazy. A big semi just smashed into my car. Yeah, it was, it was nuts. Uh, it was going about 70 miles an hour. And uh, yeah, how was your week? I mean, as, and then you go outside, you look at my Civic, my little Civic, and there's like no evidence of anything. It looks fine. And you look at me, and I mean, things are a little off, but still, I mean, I, I look normally, you know, somewhat proportional, and uh, there's no glass in my clothes, you would naturally conclude that I'm mistaken, confused, or lying, right? Something that big, that powerful, leaves evidence. And how much more should an encounter with King Jesus leave us permanently changed? Granted, a lot of spiritual growth is slow, gradual, Two steps forward, one step back. But is there evidence in your life and in my life that we've encountered Jesus? 
Well, privilege two of the gospel for Paul is inviting family and friends. We read again in Romans 1.16 that he says the gospel is first to the Jew. This is really important for Paul. Although his missionary journeys will end up primarily with Gentiles, he always starts in the synagogue, the place where his own people gather. Remarkably, he'll say in Romans 9.2, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish myself that I were cursed and cut off for, from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. You see what he's saying there? I love them so much, I would trade my salvation for theirs. It's really amazing. And I don't think this is uh, just Jewish people in general, although Paul has a connection with every Jew that he meets. I think as Paul writes Romans 9, He thinks of names and faces, family members and friends. Isn't it interesting that Paul never mentions family members in his letters? We read about one nephew, that's about it. Why is this? Well, I think most of his family rejected his message. They rejected him. Some people even think Paul was married. Maybe his wife rejected him. So all of his work starts with the Jewish people in mind. He has them in the back of his brain. But God has a specific plan with Paul and the non-Jew. That's who he sent them to the Gentiles, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. So privilege number three, after inviting family and friends, now he gets to tell the Gentiles what God has done for them. In fact, Paul will even tie his ministry to the Gentiles, back to the Jews. He says, I'm doing this. I'm preaching the gospel to Gentiles to make the Jews jealous. He says that in Romans 11, 11. I want them to see what's happening, God at work in the Gentiles, and they'll get jealous and maybe they'll want some of that. They'll want to come back in. So he goes to the Gentiles, Romans 1, 5. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege, the grace, and authority as apostles to tell the Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. Paul is thankful for the honor to take this message to the entire known world. And I don't think the world, I don't think any of us quite grasp what we owe the Apostle Paul. The entire world. Human rights, the equality of every person, the undermining of slavery, the necessity of consent, the freedom of the conscience. I think a good case can be made that everything we enjoy in this world so much is an outgrowth of Paul's preaching of this message. God loves us. Jesus died for us. Jesus is king. And every individual is responsible to respond to that message in faith. Well, finally, privilege number four related to the third one is uh, making God famous. Again, Paul anchors his preaching to the Gentiles in that so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name to glorify God. Paul is so uninterested in promoting his own brand in building his own kingdom and accruing lots of Facebook followers because he had Facebook, I'm sure, right? He's not about his own glory or fame. He's about God's fame. As John the baptizer once put it, he must increase, I must decrease. And I'm happy to do so. There's so much more freedom and joy in not being the center of attention. And again, it comes back to who Paul works for. He loves his boss. He loves his master. He loves making his master look good. It was what Paul is made for, and it's what we're made for. To glorify God and enjoy him forever, as the Westminster Shorter Catechism put it over 400 years ago. I read an article in Christianity Today the other day uh, by Sarah Billups, and it's entitled, My New Year's Resolution to Call Myself Christian in Public. In the subtitle, which you probably can't read there, it says, After years of playing it cool with my unbelieving friends, I can tell you it only gets weirder, weirder to talk about faith the longer you wait. And the headline itself really grabbed my attention. That's totally been my experience, I think. Playing it a little too cool. Yes, even a pastor. And on the one hand, I think this is partially motivated by seeing so many cringy spiritual conversations 
where the Christian thinks the non-Christian knows all the religious lingo and cliches. But, you know, on the other hand, I mean, these individuals are still way bolder and more explicitly Christian than I am often in the world. My temptation is to kind of, you know, just ask questions and play it cool and not be weird. Even when people ask me what I do for a living, like, it, it makes me feel weird. Like, how do I respond to that? Because, you know, the only image that people often have of, of pastors is Reverend Lovejoy from The Simpsons. <laughs> just like, uh, parasitical at worst and irrelevant at best. Uh, I mean, like, maybe I'll be in Rogue Roasters, and, and they'll be like, the, the place will be packed, and someone will be like, hey, Tyler, great message, you know? And I'm just like, hey, can you play it down? You know? Like, let's not be weird here. Let's not rock the boat. And, and a lot of this is totally fear-based, not faith-based. So I, don't, I haven't thought about this a ton. This was just a recent article, but I'm going to be processing this and praying uh, through this a little more uh, for this next year. And I hope you'll join me in that as well. Uh, and what it means to not be ashamed, to be more direct, while still maintaining grace towards non-believers, not kind of pummeling them uh, with the Bible. Kind of like our Godspace series a little while back. Well, we've looked at the shame of the gospel. We've looked at the privilege. Let's finally look at the product of the gospel. And I'm going to invite the worship team back up uh, for this. Well, what does working for King Jesus produce? And we see this in chapter 1, uh, Paul's thankfulness, prayers, and passion. So verse 8, Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way will be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so I may impart some sort of spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. Notice Paul does not just jump into prayer for their problems. Okay? Uh, and, and they all, you know, we all have them. They all have them, right? I mean, he doesn't say, Lord, we pray that the Jews and Gentiles would stop fighting about whether or not to have bacon in their eggs. The, the kind of parent prayers, right? Lord, we pray or my kids would start getting along. Right? No, Paul starts with thankfulness and encouragement. I'm so thankful that your faith is reported over the entire world, Romans. Paul tells the church in Philippi something similar. I thank my God every time I remember you. My uncle, who's since gone to be with the Lord, used to put that on every one of his email uh, exchanges. I think that's pretty cool. Romans 1, 9, how constantly I remember you. Paul's memory is constant, not just once on their birthday. Constantly thinking and thanking God for them, praying for them, even worrying about them. He'll tell the Corinthian church, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Like a loving mother or father, Paul goes to bed thinking about the Christians in Rome and in Philippi and in Corinth. Sometimes he's happy, sometimes he's worried, sometimes he's angry, but always he tries to start with what he's thankful for, reminding himself what God has already done here. And it's from that foundation of gratitude that real prayer can grow. See, without that foundation, our prayers won't be strong. They won't be based in a big, awesome God who's already moved mountains. See, thanksgiving is the fuel, the food, the gasoline to sustain long-term prayer. God, I'm thankful you've done this, and now I'm more confident that you're able to do this. Because, God is, because Paul is thankful to God for the Romans, he can be confident that God can help the Romans. Let's pray. So God, may we live more openly Christian this year. May we not be embarrassed or ashamed of the gospel never treating non-believers poorly, never browbeating or Bible thumping, but never hiding our faith either. 
Help us to continue to practice God's space with our friends, family, and neighbors. Opening up, opening up space for natural, spiritual conversations. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the power of God at work in each of our lives. Amen. Amen. Well, as our ushers come this morning to receive this morning's offering, uh, I found this offering prayer, and I thought we could read it together. So it's going to be on the screen here. Let's read this offering prayer together. Gracious God, everything we have comes from you. You fill us with good things. Our hearts and lives overflow with your abundance. With thanksgiving, we bring to you our time, talents, and tithes. Use these gifts that you have given us to feed others as we have been fed, to serve others as we have been served, and to bless others if we have been blessed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.